I've titled the, the presentation today, If We All Knew What We All Know. I guess if you were a, an audience that I was interacting with I, at this stage, I'd ask you if you have any thoughts about what that means. But given it's a webinar, it doesn't really lend itself to that. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give you an introduction. I'm going to talk to you about the context of knowledge management the challenges that we're facing in United Utilities, the development of a process that we've called ROC, or Reuse of Company Knowledge. I'll then summarize. OK, so first off, a little bit about United Utilities. Uh, there's a little map on your screen there that shows where we are. We hold the license to provide water and wastewater services to about 7 million people in the northwest of England. And these services are very carefully regulated by the water regulator off what. Between 2010 and 2015, we invested almost three billion pounds worth of customers' money to improve water and wastewater infrastructure uh, in the Northwest. And since 1990, we've spent about 4,000 pounds for every household in the Northwest. Just to give you a, an idea of the scale, uh, we're talking about 42,000 kilometers of water pipe, 76,000 kilometers of sewers, a lot of wastewater treatment works, and 94 treatment works. If you don't know where the Northwest is, here's a few characters, Fred Dibner and the Beatles that you might be familiar with. So I was going to tell you a little bit about me, but probably all you need to know is that my name's Andy Wall. If you need to get in contact with me, I'm on LinkedIn. If you get to see me, uh, that photograph's five years older, five years younger than I am now, so uh, look for an older, slightly plumper person. What do we mean when we talk about knowledge management? Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about a system that we're using to improve our knowledge management. But what is knowledge management to us? Well, Wikipedia describes it as a process of capturing, developing, sharing, and effectively using organizational knowledge. Now, sharing knowledge isn't something that's new. I wonder if anyone could hazard a guess how long it's been going on. I'd never heard of it until about six years ago. So relatively speaking, that makes me fairly new to knowledge management. Here's a picture which some of you might recognize. Uh, you might think it's a cave painting, but I like to think of it as the earliest recorded professional publication on knowledge management. Uh, it had its disadvantages. Of course, recording our knowledge on cave walls uh, wasn't too good when uh, we moved house because that recorded knowledge stayed behind. What would success look like if we all knew what we all know? Well. There's a little picture in the in the screen there, Dr. Emmett Brown, some of you might recognize from the movie Back to the Future, where he tries to learn about sharing uh, knowledge with, uh, with another character in the film. Another way of looking at it from a science fiction perspective, for those of you who are familiar with Star Trek The Next Generation, there is uh, a race of creatures known as the Borg, and those uh, cybernetic beings that don't really have any individuality. They're all part of what's called a collective or a hive mind. Now, it's probably worth saying that we're some way away from that. Uh, we're not doing that at United Utilities. Our objective really is to create value by sharing what we know. There are a number of things that we're doing there to maximize the value of the knowledge that we already have, but a key part is the flow of knowledge across different parts of the organization. So I've got a little diagram here that we've used to show how we're trying to continuously manage and improve our knowledge. Essentially, we have our suite of standards, the, the top wheel in the middle, which we call our codified standards. We have production lines where we're treating wastewater and uh, supplying clean water. And we're trying to capture the nuggets from various projects 
and put that into a system and communicate it to all our colleagues so that the ultimate output is that we all know what we all know. From some research work I've been involved with at Henley Business School, I'm aware that good practice requires a mixture of systematic and non-systematic methods to be used to facilitate the, the flow or the diffusion of knowledge across organizations. So I'm going to talk briefly about a systematic method that we've been developing to do this. We call that method ROC, or Reuse of Company Knowledge. But it's important to stress that that only works within a context of lots of other uh, knowledge sharing activities, whether they be written standards, whether it be a discussion by the coffee machine, a lessons learned system, etc. Before I start to talk about ROC, it's just worth uh, mentioning the size of the, the challenge that we have within United Utilities. Uh, for the next uh, just over four years remaining of this asset management plan period, uh, we've got a massive capital program of about three billion pounds, and perhaps we've got no way to systematically capture or disseminate good ideas and good practice. We've got new capital delivery partners on board for the, at least the next five years, and we're all being incentivized to innovate. We'll be doing less work internally, so there'll be less, uh, there'll be less work done by our own people, more done by the capital delivery partners. And we need to link our learning and our knowledge to the specific assets that we're building. Within UU, we don't get to up update our costs for projects in real time. Often it can be many months after a job's finished. And as you can imagine, jobs that have started uh, within that period won't have the benefit of, of those new costs. We need to communicate the opportunities for savings or health and safety improvements as quickly and as effectively as we can. I, w I won't be the first person to talk about lessons learned. Like most large companies, UU has had lessons learned databases. But we recognize that there are limitations to this approach. And about two years ago, we began to evolve a different approach. Remembering that a lesson's only been learned when the behaviors have changed. That can, that can be a long time, and it can be difficult to demonstrate across a large organization. So what came, comes next in our story or our journey is something that we're calling ROC, or reuse of company knowledge. What we're trying to do with ROC is to bring, is to introduce a system that links good ideas, in, improvements, innovation to the type of asset that the good idea relates to. So is it a pumping station control panel, a pump, a footpath, a specific type of tank? So we link the idea to the asset through its existing asset code. We, we use some codes called area element codes, but in each industry it might be different. So whenever the cost, so whenever we cost up a new or refurbished asset, we can also deliver a targeted list of good ideas that's specific to that type of asset. And I guess that's quite important if you're a project manager, uh, because you don't want uh, good ideas that don't relate to your project. So within that system, we can use that same relationship that we're building up with the project to encourage the project team to share their own good ideas at the end of the project and add them to the system that will be later shared with projects that are coming along. What we've got here is a, a, I've tried to a simplified diagram. I'm not sure all the arrows point in the right direction on this slide, but what it's trying to get across is that if you, if you look to the left-hand side of your screen, that's where we gather opportunities from whatever systems we might already have and where we identify opportunities that exist on new projects. And we call this the pull part of the process where we're drawing knowledge in. And if you look to the bottom left, this is where we code the opportunities against certain asset types and put good practice into our suite of standards for the assets that we're building. The right-hand side of, of the screen, sort of right of the, the P in, in process in the middle, describes the push part of this process, 
where we systematically inform project managers about the good ideas, suggestions and innovations that they might be able to use on their projects. The key here again is that they're sorted by asset or sub-asset type. So if you're a PM building a nuclear submarine, you don't get told about all the innovative ideas on road building. The next slide shows it a little bit more uh, succinctly showing the, the, the pull from really any phase in the project life cycle, uh, capturing the opportunities and then pushing them back into the project. This slide shows us w what we've worked on so far, which is the development of a relational database. And that's built ready for the content that we're gathering. That, again, you can see on the left hand side the good ideas opportunities input form and then through the rock database how we uh, systematically uh, gather those opportunities and disseminate them. What we end up with is an output sheet that looks something like this. This is one that we tried for Whaley Bridge and effectively what it does is it gives a list of all the good ideas for the project team to consider. In terms of where are we up to at the moment, uh, well, we're not as far as we should be, that's for sure. Uh, I've got a list of excuses as long as my arm in case my boss is listening. But what we have done is we've demonstrated the concept using historical content that we collected for other purposes. We've built the rock into our project delivery system and our ways of working and we're now going to start collecting new content uh, as AMP 6 projects start. Our aim is eventually to build a self-service system really. Uh, we, we've been quite heavily reliant on manually collecting this data, making sure that it gets into the database and serving the project community when we were trialing it. But really, uh, does need to be a self-service system in the long run. So just quickly summarizing, we've developed the ROC process uh, to address problems that exist across many large organizations. We achieve it by collecting and recording good ideas from across our organization and ensuring that we keep the project teams informed. We change our own internal standards or our governance procedures wherever necessary. But the key here is aligning the opportunities against the, project in our, the projects in our capital program and maximizing the chance of improving time, cost and quality benefits. For those of you familiar with the definition of luck, which goes something like, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. What we're doing here with this is we're trying to prepare in advance and make our own look uh, for the various projects. Hello everyone, I'm Adrian Malone. I'm Group Head of Knowledge Management and Collaboration at Atkins. Atkins is a design and engineering and project management consultancy. Um, we've got about 18,000 employees around the world with annual revenues of, of around 1.75 billion. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is a journey that I set up on um, really uh, less than a year ago, which was all around exam exploring the use of more agile approaches and lean approaches as part of an experiment in the way that we deliver a global knowledge management approach within Atkins. So today I'm going to share some early insights. Um, we're, we're, we've still got a long way to go down the road. Um, we've traveled some distance, but we've got further to go still. Um, so this is very much work in progress. It's something which touches pockets of our organization currently, but not the whole. Um, but I, I'll share with you some early thoughts about how digital and, and digital disruption and some other forces are really beginning to stimulate the way that we uh, explore and, and deliver knowledge management within, within my business. I'm going to talk a little bit about Agile and Lean. Um, and Agile in particular is a term that means so many different things to different people. Um, which can be awfully confusing. What I'm referring to here is the use of agile thinking to help to change the way in which we engage with colleagues across the business, 
working with other stakeholders. So here, Agile is very much being used in the context of behavior and about how we change our culture um, from working with short, fat projects, as we describe them, rather than long, thin projects. It's about encouraging a bolder and more experimental approach and about learning through doing. So I'm experimenting with things like minimum viable products or MVPs and these are used to test hypotheses early so what this means is that rather than assume we've got the right solution from the start we create a minimum version of the proposed solution or a set of solutions and we test these with end users before we invest any more time in their full development. A key piece of the cultural jigsaw around this is the principle of fail fast and, and pivot. So these are terms that we use in, in Agile and what these really mean is um, to continually check that we're still on the right track to achieve our outcome and indeed to check that the outcome itself remains valid. Failing fast means we don't burn effort when something's not working um, and it means that we have to have the courage to change course or to pivot or even to stop. So some real changes in terms of how we how we how we tackle change, um, and as I say, some some real interesting learning along the way. A key element of agile is working with short, focused bursts. These are called sprints in agile terminology. Each sprint delivers a complete package of work. So we break the work down into a set of chunks um, or, or, or sprint backlogs, as they're described, and we deliver them in short bursts of very focused activity. Typically, these sprints last a week sometimes two, but typically one week, and we use daily stand-up meetings, so we get the whole team of people who are involved in a sprint together every day, perhaps just for 15 minutes. Um, the team come together to quickly update on what they did yesterday, what they plan to do today, and if there are any blockers. Using this approach um, on one project allowed us, for example, to identify that Whilst we were doing some good work, we were we were traveling in a track in a direction that wasn't the most productive, most productive and most useful. And within just three days, we were able to do sufficient work to learn that we needed to pivot or change direction, identify what the the new plan needed to look like, and switch across to to the new track and, and begin working in a, on a on a different set of outcomes and a different set of deliverables. This is something which, through a more traditional approach, might have taken us weeks to identify. Um, so one of the benefits of Agile is around bringing people together um, with real close and frequent communication, um, keeping each other informed about what we're doing, testing what we're doing against the requirements and against the customer's need. Um, and that, that's proven to be very powerful for us. True Agile requires a team to be co-located. Um, our teams are distributed all over the world. As I said we've, we've got a large global organization. So we tend to flex the rules a little. We use Skype. Um, and share screens and, and get together on conference calls um, for our stand-ups. It still works. It's always nice to be face-to-face, -face, but that's not always possible. A really important principle about Agile is about having the customer in the room, certainly in the way that we're implementing it here. This might be an external customer or it might be an internal customer or a set of stakeholders. So we use the principle of product owner, somebody in the business who owns the business requirements and is able to make informed decisions about prioritization of work and effort. So the product owner is part of the Agile team. They attend the stand-ups, they attend the weekly meetings, and they really call the shots in terms of prioritization of effort to make sure that we're focused on the things that matter to them most. It's incredibly powerful as an approach, but it does require a large degree of openness and very rich collaboration. So it, it's, it's something that's quite challenging to begin with, but really, in my view, worth the effort. So why do I think we need to change? Why are we going through all this trouble to change how we're, we're delivering knowledge management and, and, and more generally how we're exploring different ways of working within, within my business? I think really this, this is one of my um, favorite quotes by a uh, science fiction novelist, um, a theme here from, from Andy's presentation, I guess, um, but William Gibson, um, sci-fi novelist and, and future, futurist, and, and he describes how the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And I think what this means is that there are signals around us which give a sense of how the world will be in a few years from now. We've all seen the impact of digital disruption in a number of consumer markets. If we think about um, you know, MP3 and, and CDs, or we think about streaming of, uh, of, 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 uh, of films and over the internet, for example. And increasingly, we hear about things like machine learning and robotics and the power of big data. But it's not all about technology. There are also demographic changes and changes in terms of globalization as well. 
this report is, in my view, really worth downloading. Um, it sets out the, cha the challenges facing the world today, and I think those challenges will increase as we approach 2020. So it sets out the skills that are needed today by organizations to be fit for 2020, and you can see here the challenges, and, and I expect that none of these will be a complete surprise um, to, to those of you on the webinar today. So just briefly, they look at extreme longevity, the increasing global lifespans, which are changing the nature of careers and learning, the rise of smart machines and systems with workplace automation, nudging human workers out of rote and repetitive tasks and redefining our roles. Computational world is around the massive increases in sensors and processing. So we hear a lot now about the Internet of Things and how we can um, increasingly interact with the world through the Internet and, and through smart devices. And this is really beginning to make the world a programmable system. But it's not just about technology, as I say, but there's the impact of technology in terms of how we work. So number four there looks at new media ecology. New communication tools are required and new media literacies beyond text. So we're increasingly finding that we need to communicate across multiple challenges, ch ch channels and multiple media. Number five talks about superstructured organizations, so social technologies driving new forms of production and value creation, and I'll talk briefly about that in a moment. And finally, the globally interconnected world, so increased global interconnectivity puts diversity and adaptability at the center of organizational operations. So some real challenges which are increasingly impacting how we work, and from that perspective, Organizations as a whole, and certainly the way that we tackle knowledge management challenges, I think needs to adapt to new technology, new opportunities, but also some very um, real and, and, and present challenges. So things are getting more complex. Um, one of the consequences is that the world is becoming more difficult to predict. Complexity means that whilst linear project plans still have a place, long, thin projects as an approach can present some challenges. When the world is changing quickly and decision making is distributed, across a network of stakeholders, typically who will have conflicting outcomes. Not only may the route be unclear at the start, but also the precise destination, um, which, which means that we don't always know exactly where we want to get to when we begin, and we need to go through a process of exploration and learning. So if linear processes are becoming stressed by a more complex environment, then we, need, then we turn to networks. Networks are an important part of what knowledge management is all about, connecting people to people as well as people to information, joining the dots across the organizational hierarchy and also beyond the organization itself. This has traditionally been the domain of knowledge management in terms of communities of practice and communities of interest and that's something that I think Michael will, will focus on in his presentation which comes next. So increasingly we're looking for communities to drive action. Responding to a more complex world means that we need to learn new ways of working and new ways of thinking. So this really is about culture and behavior. One of the early pieces of work that we did in, in Atkins was the creation of something we described as the playbook. So a playbook, it borrows the, uh, the metaphor from sports, um, a notebook containing descriptions and diagrams of all the possible players and strategies that can be used by a team in a particular game. And we've taken that analogy and we've applied it to ways to generate ideas, develop ideas, and communicate ideas in the organization. We're still in the process of, of rolling this out and socializing this across the business, but we've had some really good early wins with this. So the playbook provides a guide for lean and agile approaches, and we're building a community around the playbook and the use of approaches, and very much focusing on capturing stories. Storytelling in networks is an important principle for knowledge management, and one which is increasingly important in organizations adapting to the digital disruption and to complexity. So in terms of implications of some of this, agile thinking and complexity have implications at an organizational level as well as at a project or initiative level. I'm only signposting here, there's lots more thinking to do, and we've got a long journey ahead. This quote from Lalu captures an important principle that in a complex environment, we've got to sense and adapt. Agile approaches lend themselves, I think, well to this space, but we still need direction, and this is where road mapping as an approach can help, providing a long-term vision, but avoiding planning too much detail beyond the next three months, because we anticipate that the world will keep changing. So here we see an analogy of a farmer who needs to think to the future in terms of choosing which crops to plant, but shouldn't choose the date of harvest at the beginning of the year, Instead, they need to watch the weather, watch the, the crops as they grow, and pick the right day to harvest nearer the time.
And that's an analogy that I'm increasingly using in terms of planning, in, in terms of knowledge management in my organization. So this quote from Ewan Semple, um, in a great book, Organizations Don't Tweet, People Do. Ewan Semple describes an approach which has always been a tool set for knowledge managers. It's one which increasingly is relevant in the complex environments that we operate today. There's a common theme with my earlier comments. Um, complex environments require a more adaptive approach to change. Lots of small changes setting off scores of Trojan mice off into the maze in the organization is one response to this. So these mice can be the MVPs, those minimal viable products that I talk about, talked about earlier. The role of the knowledge manager or the change agent is then to amplify the success through storytelling and pick out the right projects to champion and the right solutions to support and develop further. So just a, a final, um, final, final slide from me. Um, in 10 minutes, it's only possible to point to some principles and to some signals, but here are three quick takeaways in terms of learning to date around the use of, of agile and lean principles within knowledge management in, in my project-based organization. So first of all, that the role of the project, the product owner, which is all about having the customer in the room, cannot be emphasized enough. It's incredibly important to have the, the customer or the end user prioritizing the effort and prioritizing the, what goes into each of the sprints. Incremental change, lots of short, fat projects rather than fewer, long, thin ones seems to work well in more complex environments and they're a great way of getting users across the organization engaged in the process of change and sharing knowledge. And Agile does not just mean doing things fast or not following any rules. There's structure and rigor to Agile and it's incredibly important to prioritize and remain focused. So we have to, make we have to work differently to make Agile work and this can take some getting used to. Agile is not a silver bullet, but I think it complements the knowledge management toolbox well and there's strong alignment with knowledge management principles of collaboration, openness, and being bold and experimental. So we've got a lot more to do, um, but um, it's, it's looking like it's going to be a really interesting um, and thought-provoking journey ahead. With that, I'll now hand over to Michael, who is going to give us the final presentation of this webinar before we have some questions. Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Adrian. That's great. I mean, it's sort of it's a nice little follow-on to mine, hopefully. Um, my name is Michael Norton. I work for Knowledge Hub. We're um, a, an SME that was set up to support public sector in knowledge sharing, mainly for online communities. So we'll talk about a little bit about some of the social collaboration tools we've been using, how sort of especially local government, but also now more tools of public sector, how we've been sort of sharing our knowledge and experience through online communities of practice. I'm going to take you back a little bit. I'm going to take you back to 2006. This is how long I've been doing this for. Um, this is actually before Twitter existed, and this is before even Facebook was just starting to become a thing at universities as an idea of, of a way of working. At this point, I was working for the Improvement and Development Agency for local government, and we were introduced a knowledge management strategy with the idea of trying to allow local government to share their knowledge and experience between each other. There's at the moment, I think it's like 340 odd local authorities in England and Wales, and then they also got Scotland, Northern Ireland. So a lot of organisations are working on very similar topics and projects, and we wanted to encourage the sharing of their experience of what they were doing, what was working, what wasn't working, in a better way so that everyone can learn from each other. And through this knowledge management strategy that was established at the IDA, we introduced the concept of community practice. So really the idea is just to try and get people to have conversations with each other. And we all do it. We will ask questions to your friends and people you know about how do we do this? Can anyone give me advice on this? And so by introducing that small concept that now, we can share with each other. Really sort of change the sort of culture of the um, local government and really sort of try to put, put the emphasis on that. We can talk to each other. We can learn from each other. We can share ideas with each other. And we can move things around a lot quicker than bringing in consultants. And we all have the experience and knowledge that we can all share with each other. Back in 2006, we introduced some really simple collaboration tools into this, this area of work. So we introduced things such as forums and wikis and libraries, blogging, event calendars and ideas, just to get people to understand that they can share in different ways. Um, we, we did a lot of work around saying to people, there's a whole suite of tools out there you can use, but you need to know why you're using them first. So if you want a conversation with someone, go towards a forum, because you want to ask questions, you want to get responses back. 
you're looking at the idea of a wiki. You can co-create documents together, which you couldn't do that really before. People are sharing a huge amount of documentation, guides on how to, how to work, FAQs, templates, which you didn't have to rewrite from scratch. And one example I always go back to, uh, especially in local government, when a new white paper comes out, previously every local authority would get the white paper, someone would spend probably five, six, seven hours looking for it and create a summary, which would then go on to the chief executive and also some of the lead councillors. So every organisation was doing this. But why was that happening? Why weren't we sharing one version of that? So we switched it around a little bit when I was at the IDA where, lucky enough, we managed to get a copy of it just before everyone else did. Someone spent spend a bit of time going through it, reviewing it, and then to share that one document with everybody. So each organisation only had to tweak it for their own, own benefits. It saves a huge amount of time and effort because one person was doing it and it had been shared across everybody, every, every organisation. What's also happened now, especially with social media, social media is everywhere. I mean, everyone thinks it's very easy. I mean, Adrian mentioned the idea of the future work skills, the whole idea of actually using different technology and also having the skills to work in this way is very, very important. So it has some benefits behind the idea of social media. It's more, it's more available now, people are aware of it, people can see how it can be used. But trying to get it to fit into your work environment is always the hard part. There's an awful lot of um, organisations that introduce different social media tools and a lot of people in the organisation will sit in there scratching their head going, well, that's good, but how do I actually use it? What am I going to use it for? So when you are looking at these types of collaboration tools, you've got to think about why, why, what's the need, how are we going to roll it out, is it going to work well for us, and does it fit the purpose? Because sometimes like, bringing the social media element in isn't where you really get the answers for what you really need. I'll explain this really simply. I mean, if you've got a question that you really need some in-depth response back, can you do it on Twitter? You've only got 140 characters for someone to respond back to. It makes it quite difficult to have that conversation. Also bring a lot of people in as well. I mean, if you ever ask a question on Facebook, you may occasionally get a, get a like, but you never get a response back. You may occasionally get that. So these types of tools, you need to work out what's right for you. And if you want an instruction manual, or learn how to really do something with a particular piece of work or some sort of cabinet. I mean, this my example is uh, if you need to build a cabinet, you go to YouTube. There's amazing videos on there. But again, it doesn't really create the conversation around it that easily because someone's trying to demonstrate it. So we've been trying to work on the idea of creating conversations through communities of practice over the last sort of 10 years within the public sector to try and get them to share with each other, give them the skills to be able to enable that to happen as well. Because you know, everyone here, I mean, you've probably all done this, that something may be broken in your house or you, you've, you're going to try and find something out. You know, we do a search online. You know, we finish up on what I, there's a forum or an online community and the people have come together to share their knowledge, their experience. Most people will only go along, pick up what they need and then leave. And that's fine. We're quite happy with that. But the knowledge is still being imparted and pushed around through other circles. But that's why communities have been very successful with what we've with the, in, with the internet coming about because that's that was one of the early things that started. I mean, if you go back to sort of 1995, no, 1985, there was the establishment of um, a community called The Well, which from The Well spiraled out things like Craigslist, Craigslist and eBay because of that community spirit. And that was actually from the hippie movement as well, which I thought was quite, quite interesting, all about the idea of co-collaboration, people coming together to share and learn from each other. One thing we found out, by running sort of online communities for the last 10 years that it can give you lots of benefits as well. It's definitely helped people discover knowledge about how to do their job in a better way, I mean, especially working in the public sector. You, you haven't always got a, a big team around you with all the big budget cuts we've had over the last sort of five, six years. So sometimes talking to other, other people in other organisations is really beneficial to you in your job. Actually to connect with other people, you get to share ideas, bounce things off each other. It's been very good at saving time and money where people are not replicating the thing over and over and over again. And also, what's allowed a lot of um, people to do in our sector is to come together and generate new ideas, so try things out, suggest things. I mean, I know Adrian mentioned about Agile. There's organisations that are doing this, looking at the Agile ideas and trying to share different bits out there. But also, it's raising your profile. If you're very good at, you know, if you're interested in sharing, helping each other out, you get a lot of benefit from it. Also, other people can see how what you're doing, you can tap into it, and it, it means you can do things that you probably never could do before. And also, we know that 
uh, online collaboration tools are, are really, really important for businesses. I mean, this is a little quote from Clint. Uh, so many organisations want to use online collaboration tools. And it's really, uh, is very important. It's about getting the right type of collaboration within your organisation, make sure you've got that right culture that can share, are looking to share with each other and want to learn from each other as well. There's no point just putting in a new collaboration tool and expect it all to happen straight away because it won't happen. Technology will not solve the problem that you're trying to solve. So what we've been trying to do over the last 10 years is trying to get that blend of organisations formal knowledge with people's informal knowledge. I mean, we always know more than we can ever write down and trying to get that to be shared across different organisations in the public sector. I mean, the public sector is quite, quite a big environment. I mean, not only has it got local authorities, you've got the central government, you've got voluntary, you've got fire, police, you've got lots of organisations working for the improvement of the public sector. So we're trying to encourage everyone to come together, share with each other, learn from each other, but also trying to get that right balance of language that people are using. Everyone asks what's made it successful over the last sort of 10 years, it's the people. People make things happen. I mean, my, my analogy I always use is everyone's got a group of friends. And you think about it, when you all meet up, who are the one or two people that get everyone together for those meetups? This works with a community approach as well. It's always one or two people behind the scenes that always get people talking, encourage people to share with each other. Without those people, things don't happen. So the people are so key behind this. It doesn't matter what technology is out there. The people getting everyone to connect, network of each other, encourage them to share, answering questions, making them feel welcome is what makes this type of approach of communities really successful. Also, the digital skills is also quite important to this as well. It's still quite a new area of work. The whole concept of community management is still quite new. There's a lot of people still learning about how you get people to engage and what different social science skills you can bring into this type of approach as well, about what makes people interact, why people come back on a regular basis. So there's a whole, still quite a new environment for getting people together to work with each other. I mean, these are a couple of quotes that we've had from some of our, our users about how they get people to share with each other, how it's been saving an awful lot of time and effort, but also the ability to share expertise, which they can tap into as well. So it's really sort of quite a simple approach. Uh, people like talking to people. People are happy to share with each other if they if you ask the right question in the right environment. So we've been quite successful across sort of England, Wales, and Scotland. So that's where our main remit has always been to start to start with. But we're actually expanding out now. We're saying, well, why just limit it just to the UK? Let's let's bring in worldwide audiences. So we just introduced um, another group in from called UDEEP, which is the Chief Exec Network from across Europe starting to bring in organisations that are doing similar work in South Australia and America because we've all got knowledge and experience that we can share. So we want to sort of allow people to have that connectivity between different countries, different organisations, so that stimulates a bit of innovation as well and some new ideas. But we're also trying to go down to the basic level that a lot of organisations struggle to share internally as well. So how can we encourage that to happen as well, trying to get the belief and the culture right that people can share internally, that one one department can share with another department, even though the subjects may be different, there may be a lot of crossovers that they didn't realise that were there originally. So that's where we've been, we're looking to go towards in the future, that we believe that anyone working in the public sector environment should be able to share with each other, should be able to learn from each other, and it doesn't matter where, they, where you come from, that um, you can really sort of spark ideas, innovation, and really improve the, the way you do your work. So that's, that's it from me. Um, it's a very quick whistle-stop tour of what we've been doing over the last few years on the Knowledge Hub and how we've been doing it in the public sector. So that's my details if anyone needs, needs to sort of get in touch with me or ask any questions. I'm going to pass you over to Martin who's going to sort of finish the, um, our, our webinar off for you. So Andy, uh, the first question that came in for you was about um, the flow of ideas out of the project back via rock, I think, in, back into the project, if you like. And uh, somebody called Jay Jess has asked, how do you identify at UU which good ideas are relevant to a particular project or person? So OK. Okay. OK, what? Uh, probably the best way to answer that is to say that we gather all of the, the good ideas that people offer to us, and we then um, how would I say this? We we align them to the t particular assets that we're building. 
to the particular assets that we, we have within the company. And when we come to build new assets like that, uh, they all share the same uh, asset codes, which we call area element codes. So whenever a project is has been costed up using those area element codes, we can direct the good ideas that relate to those assets with the same area element codes to those projects. So that's the theory. Uh, making it work in practice is is a lot harder, and at the moment, it's taking up. Uh, it takes up time, and really, our objective is to try and make it a self-service system in the long term. Uh, so that, for instance, the, the sort of dream is that project manager would be able to log onto the system and download a list of uh, good ideas that relate to a particular project number because the system will already know the assets that that project's building. But we're doing things a lot more manually than that at the moment, but that's the, the sort of long-term aspiration. Another question that arrived uh, in light of your presentation, Andy, was saying is a platform for rock like share room or is it more of a custom system that was built for this purpose okay uh, what we built at the moment is a relational database uh, it's a standalone database that really only my team can can access and the purpose of building that database was really to test the concept it, it won't really it won't work like that uh, it won't be able to work like that as we roll it out to the to the wider business, it will have to be on a, a shared sort of platform, probably in SharePoint. Uh, but we have the added complication of our construction delivery partners not being able to access the UU SharePoint system. So other alternatives might be ProjectWise or Business Collaborator, or in fact some other uh, neutral platform. But whatever it is, it has, you know, it's not just having a bank of good ideas that's not accessible to the people that need it. So that's a, a sort of IT problem that we're, we will have to overcome. Can you give any practical examples of your agile work? Yeah, so um, I think a, a couple of examples. Um, the, the focus of our agile effort so far in this early phase has been tended to be more on the technology project side of, of, of knowledge management. So looking at our portals, looking at um, our um, our intranet and, and the way that we organize and make available information. Um, and I guess that that's probably to a certain extent because Agile um, has got very strong foundations in, in software development and, and in product development. Mm -hmm. So we've really been kind of holding our skills in that space first. Um, so a couple of examples. We did an early piece of work on the first um, Agile pieces of work I was involved in uh, in terms of knowledge management here was around looking at um, different ways to improve search relevance and, and bring back better results um, in terms of how information was organized and, and returned um, within our internet environment. Um, and we went through um, four, four one-week sprints there um, with a sprint zero to do a bit of planning. But what essentially we did was to, to develop some personas, develop some um, use cases and understand um, different search needs that we had in our organization and then test different versions of our technology platform and different ways of using our technology platform in terms of our intranet to see how we could improve the relevance um, and the confidence in, in documents returned because like most large organizations we've got vast quantities of information on our intranet um, and then all the associated SharePoint sites and, and other sites that are got around the organization so we wanted people to be able to find that information quite quickly. Now, this is where the example of, um, of an early pivot came in because during the process of, of putting together those personas and starting to investigate options, what we realized was that we were going to be upgrading our tool set and that was going to give us access to some smart tools that would start to use things like machine learning to help us to, to tackle some of those challenges. Um, so we, we pivoted from that. We didn't want to go and build something that we were going to be able to buy um, in terms of our in terms of our technology platform upgrades, so what we did instead was to focus on issues around ownership of information and around identifying the behaviours and the ways of working um, 
that would allow people to, to find content and manage content more easily. So that the example of Pivot there was to not just look at are the outcomes um, valid, but also is the world in which we're operating, the context in which we're doing this is changing. We recognize we're going to get some new tools and some new capabilities. So let's not reinvent something that's already going to be um, out there. And we discovered that through the early work and through bringing the team together in those daily stand-ups and, and in the retrospectives, which um, I'll kind of look back in terms of what we've achieved. Um, and it was a nice example of how um, Agile can can inform um, those kind of decisions at a much earlier stage. What, we, what we're focused on at the moment, therefore, is, is around building some approaches to organizing content um, and building portals that provide different groups of um, users in our, in our organization with the content that they need in order to be able to, to, to deliver a particular task. Um, so we're, we're working on a principle of, of building templates, um, both in terms of how the information is presented, but also approaches to tackling the problem and ways of working um, that can then be reused and, and, and scaled um, once they've been refined and protected on, on, on one use case. So we've gone through a process of, again, identifying who our user base are, who's going to be using this particular set of information, building some personas and building those very much with the customer in the room and engage with us and inform in that discussion. Um, and then sitting down with our, with our internal customer in this case and said, okay, these are all the things that we could do, but we've got a finite amount of resource, we've got a finite amount of time. So what are the priorities? So we start with this fast backlog that is described of different pieces of the work. And then um, with with the the product owner from, from, from the business, we then prioritize those and say, okay, what are we going to tackle in sprint one? And what are we going to tackle in sprint two? And we continue to, to refine that as, as we go and, and adapt to what we learn and, and to what we develop. So it's working very well in a, in a, in a technology-rich environment. The next step for us, and I think the really exciting bit is going to be to transfer that into um, into non-technical programs as well. So ways of working um, and ways of collaborating more widely across the, the organization. And we've got some great examples of that already dotted around the business. Um, but um, we're, we're going to pull together the stories and uh, perhaps on another occasion I'll be able to share a bit more of that, that sort of more recent step with you. No, not always. Um, sometimes you can have some uh, bit of knowledge which may work in one context that may be very different in a different context as well. So if you take the example, I mean, the knowledge of, of getting a train, maybe the details of it, but then it's your experience about how you want to actually implement it can be, can be quite, can be quite different. And when I say about the idea of knowledge and experience within within the communities, is that the, the experience can be done in different ways. That somebody maybe from one organisation may experience a way of working in a completely different way because of the culture of that organisation. And so it's that, that it's it going through there, it's actually doing it that you really sort of gain experience. But the knowledge can be passed on in different ways by somebody sharing what they do or having a conversation about it. So I do change them in between. No, I do interchangeable some ways. This is about the context behind it that you can adapt and change. Another fairly big question, <laughs> uh, which is uh, about uh, your your job title actually. So um, Raymond again is asking your title is group head of KM and collaboration, but isn't collaboration part of KM? I, I think it is. I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, I guess what we do communicate through that title was that um, you know knowledge sharing is, is a collaborative process. It wasn't just about systems and tools and technology, but it was very much about people working together. And that's why we, we kind of use both words in terms of describing my role. But uh, no, absolutely, I think knowledge management, collaboration, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff is all about how we work smarter and better together internally and with, with people outside of our organization.